I'm often referred to as an educator, but I'm actually a teacher, a very nervous high school teacher. Recently, this, this high school teacher tried her hand at an online test. The questions are from a show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Imagine my surprise and shock to find out that I'm not as smart as a fifth grader. In fact, I'm just about as smart as a first grader. The only two people who are smarter than fifth graders in the whole of America, from the thousands of people who sat for the show, one, both of them are academics. One is called uh, George Smoot, and he's the winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics. And the other is a woman called Kathy Cox. She's the superintendent of schools in Georgia, and she's an advocate of uh, standardized testing. So just about, I mean, she's lucky that she passed that test. So I got to thinking, but this is America, right? This is where adults voted in for Donald, Donald Trump, so it kind of makes sense that they're not as smart as fifth graders. So I thought about, what about the Indians? and the Australians and the Canadians. So I scoured the internet for the countries who had done similar shows as Are You Smart as a Fifth Grader? And there are lots of them. But to my surprise, I figured out that none of the adults really in the world are as smart as fifth graders. Now keep in mind, all the questions asked to me and to all the people on the show are from the primary school textbooks of grades one to five. So there are a couple of samples I'll share with you of the questions that I failed to answer. One was, uh, what Jamestown settler married Pocahontas in 1614? And another one's right here, what Puritan was elected governor, blah, 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 blue, 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 blue. So one, is, one thing I could do is take solace that, you know, adults in the world are as dumb as me. But could there be another conclusion one that would be kinder to my self-image as a high school teacher. Could it be that we don't know the questions and answers that we learned from our elementary textbooks because the content held no relevance, interest or meaning to our brains in grade five and they definitely hold no interest, relevance or meaning to our adults' brains. The human brain has a quest to survive and thrive and it will retain information that is relevant, meaningful, and interesting in its quest to survive and thrive. Now, some of us may have aced the grade five tests because we had some reason to ace the grade five tests when we were in grade five. We wanted to survive when we went home with our report cards. But this information went into our short-term memory system in and short-term memory system out. What a waste of all those years we spent in school. Now, surprisingly, while we've made huge advancements in medicine, technology and science, we've done very, very little in education. Our education system is absolutely broken. We don't need little tweaks and fixes. We need an absolute rethink, reimagine, reinvent disruption. And we need four parties to come together to do this. One is industry to tell us what jobs will be there in the future, what aptitudes and skills will be required to fulfill those jobs. The second are parents to stop pressuring schools into getting grades and scores, but into igniting human greatness instead. The third are politicians who will create policies and look at the board examinations from this point of view. And we educators, because then we will execute this. So let's look at what happens to an average kid from the time he enters school to the time he graduates. Kids are innately curious, they're naturally moonshot thinkers. Think of some of the questions that children ask. Why did swear words get invented if we're not allowed to use them? Or one that a, a child in our kindergarten cl class recently asked. My mummy just gave birth to a baby. My daddy doesn't lay eggs. So he's not a reptile, and he doesn't give birth to babies, so he's not a mammal. I wonder what he is. And this very deep, insightful question my three-year-old son Drish asked me before he turned vegetarian. Mama, what if somebody killed me and ate me? How would it make you feel? I can hear this chicken's mummy crying for him. Interestingly, that deep, meaningful question has meant he's a vegetarian even today, and he's 27. Just look at the world through the eyes of a child. Anything's possible. Everything's magical. Everything's inspirational. Nothing is impossible. The questions what, when, and where seem to be a code in everyone's academic DNA. 
instead of asking the correct questions, why, what if. Also, in school, we learn very quickly that we're rewarded for having the right answers, not asking the good questions, which explains why kids who enter asking so many whys and what ifs eventually get drilled out of it. If I were to rapid fire in this room right now with a group of questions, and one of them was A is for, 98% of you would come back with the word apple. Like 98% of the world would come back with the word, word apple. This is what we learn in school from the beginning to the time we graduate to conform, not to create. I'll tell you another story about my son, Drish. He came to me um, in grade two, and he came to me with his assessment paper, subject English. He had to make sentences. The word given to him was boy, and this is just one example of a sentence he made. His eventual score, two out of 10, because he got half a mark cut for every word he did not know how to spell. He did not know how to spell adventurous, climbed, and mountain. This is in spite of the fact he's in grade two, and he possibly should not know how to spell those words yet. His next assessment, a month later, score 10 out of 10. But look at the, the sentences. This is a boy, that is a book. My son learned very quickly to go from creativity to conformity. He learned very quickly that school catches us out on what we don't know how to do. It does not reward us on what we do know how to do. Since the dawn of time, real moonshot change and advancements have been made by people who did not lose the ability to stay curious and ask why and what if. Imagine if Newton never asked why, or if Einstein never asked, what if I rode a beam of light across the universe? And moonshots happen in all fields, not just science. Think of the first Polynesian islander who said, what if I go this other way? He opened, he opened a moonshot thinking door. So my journey and my why, how, and what if questions came from observing my younger brother, Kamal. Kamal was an avid lover of cricket, and he was very intelligent. But his school grades said something completely different. So while he was on his toilet seat, I knew he understood his English because uh, he was very articulate and very expressive. I knew he understood his math because he understood about the scores, the distance, the speed of the ball. But the minute he got to school, he was disengaged from both his maths and his English. This was my first information gap in my brain. Why would a child who is intelligent not be able to succeed in school? Finding the answer to this information gap is what would drive me to create context of high learning, high engagement schools. Just like the information gap I have, everyone's brain seeks to fill in information gaps. So imagine if Kamal had heard this question instead, something that a recent commentator asked. How high do you think, how high do you need to hit a cricket ball in order for it to re reach terminal velocity on its way down? This question may have opened up an information gap that we, he would have had to seek to know the science, math, and English to solve. The questions I would ask about my brother would serve me when I became a teacher in Australia in 1988. I had a classroom full of teenage boys. The subject I had to teach them was Shakespeare and Wordsworth. Why do we teach kids things that they have no interest in and have no relevance to their lives? I have no clue. But what if I could create an emotional connection between what was seemingly abstract, Shakespeare and Wordsworth, and no relevance? What if I could connect it to a, and build a bridge from what they know? So I introduce the modern rock songs of the time, ballads, We Don't Need No Education, and Simon and Garfunk's Sounds of Silence. They would learn all about poetry from here and have a bridge to connect it to the seemingly abstract Shakespeare and Wordsworth. My next teaching assignment was in a prestigious school in Mumbai. I was visiting uh, Mumbai and I had 55 kids in my classroom, seated at rows of desks, barely able to move, and what I experienced broke my heart. 55 kids seated in rows, not moving, constantly rote learning for a barrage of continuous tests, which would promote my next set of questions, why? Why do we Indians promote a compliance-based learning system? Why do educationist parents 
not only support but encourage a ranking system. This is the very system that will keep us addicted to rote and drill. These whys led to my what-ifs, which would lead from my journey in Australia to building a home in India. What if we could introduce a learning system that incorporated effective, engaging, joyful learning, relevant, meaningful? What if we could design instruction that would empower teachers to ask why and what if questions over when, where and what questions? Imagine the power of shifting a question from when did the Muslim League first demand partition? Two, Napoleon once said, history is a fable agreed on by man. What if this history chapter from the Indian textbook had to be rewritten for a Pakistani class? It would be a different fable. Rewrite this chapter. Or, instead of asking, when did the Quit India movement begin? Two, imagine Gandhi lived in the age of social media. How may he have used this to achieve his purpose? Create a Quit India movement social media plan with sample uploads and posts. Think Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, blogs. The first style of questioning promotes memory. The second type of questioning creates a much deeper level of engagement, a much deeper level of thinking, a much deeper level of understanding. And the, keeps the mind curious and engaged. So we all know we're at the brink of a revolution, a huge breakthrough in the history of man. It's going to be the most profound revolution we've ever experienced. It's going to impact us personally, nationally and globally. It's, not, it's already started to change the way we work, we think, we create, we play. And it's going to continue to revolutionize it. It's certainly going to change the landscape of the type of work available and the careers. Up and it's going to change the nature of skills and aptitudes we require to do those jobs. So now as a group, we need to collectively ask, why are we training kids to spit it back facts when we've got the internet to do that? Especially in an age where knowledge is doubling every two and a half years, we've got Google and Wikipedia that can spit back facts, memorization is no longer a valued or desired skill, yet we spend 80% of our time doing that in schools. What if? We could create schools as a space where we inspire kids to think in moonshots, where they, it's a space where they could feel safe to invent, create, and discover. Humans throughout history have done things that seem normal at the time, but seem atrocious later on. Think slavery, women not being allowed to vote, exorcism, corporal punishment in schools. My God, we even used cocaine as medicine with our kids and kept them in baby cages. My belief is one day we'll look back at what we're doing to kids in our current education system with the same sort of atrociousness. Let's look at what we'll shudder, what we put our kids through. Could it be that we'll think back and think, oh my God, how do we allow a one-size-fits-all curriculum, a one-size method of teaching, and a one-size-fits-all assessment when we know every child is different? Why did we allow our children to be valued only by what their memories could hold? Why did we allow our children such long commutes on the school bus? In metropolitan cities, children spend two or more years of their life on a school bus. And this is the biggest. Why did we constantly allow politicians to subject our kids to frequent redirections and reversals based on a populist vote? We need major disruption in education. And we all know that major disruption can cause fear of change. Think about the fact that it took two centuries for us to allow the printed textbook into our classrooms. And we approached calculators with much the same trepidation and fear as we look at technology today. But instead of fear, what if we were to get excited about what this education system could look like? What is this future of learning? Could it be an education system where we value the right brain as much as the left brain? Where we teach empathy and creativity with as much importance as we teach math and science? Could it be a place where we teach kids that life is not just about material abundance? It's about, and we spend time mentoring our kids on finding fulfillment, meaning, purpose. We would include brain and mind studies where we would empower our kids to know how their minds can change the structure of their brains and influence the way they feel and therefore the way they think, the way they act and therefore the outcome of their lives. In doing so, we could, uh, we could allow our children to define their own personal values and engineer their own happiness. 
We would teach our kids all about what neuroscience tells us. How to know what their dominant learning style is and how to maximize it in order to learn. The power of visualization and the biology of belief. Today we know that thoughts are things and every thought we have impacts the quality of our life. We would move from pen and paper tests to real authentic performances of understanding which would include portfolios, podcasts and videos. We would allow our children to pursue knowledge gaps that they have. What maths and English and science do they need in order to solve this problem, in order to create that? Something that is of meaning and interest to them. We would relook re the courses that we're doing in school to include contemporary, real, relevant things. Mindfulness, relationships, 21st century thinking, mindful consumerism, exponential technology. We would recognize that our children like we adults have different sleeping patterns and when we stay true to our sleeping patterns we maximize our cognitive abilities. What about if we had school from 8 to 8 and we had learning hubs close to home that kids could attend and come to school twice a week. Imagine how many of their days we could give back and allow them to reclaim their childhood. Our schools should be based on what we observe in our study of successful people and we've seen so many of them today. It's an emotional quality not the intellectual one that separates the intelligent people from the truly magnificent people. After all, it's the mindsets of our children, not their grades, that would, will determine how happy, successful and fulfilled they are as adults. It's the quality of the questions we allow them to ask, the whys and what ifs, that will determine the course of their journey. It's the depth, depth of questions we encourage our children to ask that will determine how their lives unfold physically, emotionally and spiritually. It's this that will give our children the difference between an ordinary life and an extraordinary life, between being intelligent and being magnificent. Thank you. Mm -hmm.